I'm not of the view, and I don't think anyone on my side of the argument is of the view, that every policy, or indeed the majority of policies, need to be founded on an evidence base, whether that's scientific or social scientific. There is plenty of room in policy making for the following things. Affordability questions, um, other economic questions, having regard to what tabloid editors, sorry, the public, sorry, no, tabloid editors <laughs> think. Something called, you probably haven't heard of it, you probably heard of it more here than outside. Um, ideology, does that ring a bell? So you could have some policies based on ideology, so it's, it's just right to do things, or this other thing called manifesto commitments. Okay, and so those are all reasons, and they're not illegitimate reasons, for not having policy based on evidence, by which I mean the best scientific evidence. But there are some areas where I think it would be a bad idea, and I would encourage people to vote against politicians who don't seek to engage with the evidence base, at least explicitly in the first instance, uh, and those would be public health, environmental protection, and things like nuclear safety couple of years back when you were all in the House of Commons debating abortion and whether uh, the limit, uh, the upper limit should be reduced um, possibly to 22 weeks or 20 weeks. A lot of discussion that seemed to come out of that uh, debate was about, thing, about scientific knowledge, about uh, fetal pain, fetal viability, and that had changed and we should take account of that and therefore change the limit. Now that's not to say that that evidence isn't relevant to the debate. But if you contrast it to, for example, the debate that would have taken place about the 1967 Abortion Act, which would have involved a lot more upfront debate about morals and how we view life and the sanctity of life, um, it would seem that even the pro-life uh, campaigners weren't spending so much time talking about the morals and uh, uh, conception. They were much more talking about the science of fetal viability. Do you recognise a change in the way in which public discussions, moral discussions, political discussions are being had. That's what was interesting about that debate. What was clear from 67 and from 1990, however, despite this being essentially a moral question, not a scientific question, is that many policymakers, by which I mean MPs or parliamentarians, decided that the, the way they would solve it was stick with viability. Now, an argument could be made that that's a ridiculous, morally, ethically, politically, gender-wise, and all that stuff, not a, not a defendable position. When I tried to defend it, I was rounded upon uh, by everyone. But, but there is an argument, which is the same, many feminists don't accept and the pro-lifers don't accept, that the, the point at which the, the interests of the fetus need to be balanced with that of the mother is at viability. That is the point at which the fetus is capable of living independently of the mother. Now, most politicians, it turns out, in 67 and in 1990, said that's what they were going to go with. So we said on the Science and Technology Committee that we would then equip them with the answer to that question. We weren't saying, and we actually said in our report, this isn't necessarily the right question, but if you're asking the question, this is the answer as far as it can be delivered. And it did a good thing. Do I regret the fact that we didn't have wider questions, that we were dragged in to a debate about what the nature of good evidence was, what was the importance of sample sizes, not selective publications, what's the difference between a peer-reviewed paper and an assertion by a neonatologist from the Christian Medical Forum? No, I don't regret that because it enabled us to expose in that area as everywhere else that there is a battle not between ethics on the one hand and science on the other, but between ethics on the one hand and ethics on the other, and then science answering that narrow, probably wrong question, and anti-science or pseudoscience, which misuses statistics. Jeremy, do you recognise anything in what I am and you know, we are as the Institute of Ideas is posing as a problem today, that politicians, due to perhaps a moral vacuum, a crisis of purpose, too often look to hide behind the science and say it's the science that tells us what we must do, rather than making the political or moral case. My answer is they, they do hide behind science, uh, but I, I'd actually go much further than that. I'd say that, uh, by and large, politicians cock up every time they come into contact with science. Um, and, um, I mean, that's with a few notable exceptions. And I do think that there is deep ignorance in Parliament and within the civil service about how to get the best out of science. 
what do we want when we're making policy? We want the best evidence possible before we implement it or after we've implemented it, we want to check if it's working or not. You know, otherwise we're basing policy on ignorance and that is not what we want to do. I think science provides the evidence and then it's up to politicians and society as a whole to, uh, to act on that evidence. I don't think the science should ever say this is the situation. There may be, as Evan outlined, you know, public health and uh, nuclear safety, environmental policy, as areas where it has a, a whip hand and that may be the case. So where is, where is the conflict? Well, science often constrains the options for people. Uh, and this really can cause a conflict with ideological thinking. So, you know, if you think young offenders should be given a short, sharp shock, then you better think again, because all the studies that have been done shows that it doesn't work. And the latest evidence is a thing called Scared Straight, which is a, uh, a campaign in the USA where they take offenders round prisons and show them what their future life is going to be like if they continue to offend, and what happens. The, boy, the, the guys that attend those sessions go on to, be, uh, to offend more often than people who aren't taken on them. So, I mean, this is a challenge for politicians, you know, because, you know, the public have the same feelings as the politicians. And if they think that young offenders should be dealt with severely, the politician has one of two options, really. One, ignore the finding or suppress it. And secondly, you've got the difficult task of explaining to the public why their natural feeling, their, their yuck factor, their knee-jerk reaction is wrong. Uh, and they have to change the public perception. Uh, and, of course, there's no prizes in guessing which way they go. Uh, a couple of years back, the Department of Health announced that it uh, was promoting a new policy for pregnant women not to drink a single drop of alcohol. The Royal College of Midwives came out in disagreement with this, and it then came to uh, public attention that there was not one piece of new scientific evidence about the harm of drinking a small amount of alcohol during pregnancy, but rather the Department of Health had determined that women couldn't be trusted, and if they had one glass, they might have more, they might have a bottle, and then you've got um, you know, fetal alcohol syndrome on your hands. Nice originally agreed with the Royal College of Midwives and said, no, this is, you know, there's no basis in scientific evidence for this. And eventually, I think it was about six or nine months later, under pressure from the Department of Health, backtracked and reversed their policy. Is that not a problem? Science is self-writing. You know, if somebody makes a false finding or announces a, 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 a statement, a piece of research result that, that, that turns out to be wrong, in, in a year, two years, three years' time, it will be overturned uh, because somebody will, will actually redo the science and say it's a load of rubbish. And I think that what we're seeing here may be a factor there. I think scientists, politicians today might think that they'd like to be able to say you know, one thing, but if the science exists, it will be overturned. So in a sense, I would see that as a positive thing, you know, where science did eventually overturn... Well, it so didn't, they no, didn't. I mean, nice count out to the political oh, nice. Well, you, does anybody here think that women, pregnant women shouldn't drink anything at all? Does anybody think that? The point I'm making here is it's a policy which has fallen on deaf ears because common sense tells us it's a load of rubbish, so... Basically, I've, I'm, I'm keen on science, I always have been, and I can understand why people might feel that moving towards an evidence-based policy is a good thing. It, it, we, it seems as if we're moving towards a more rational way of organising society and that science is being taken more seriously by government. But I think there's three problems with this and three reasons that we need to be cautious. Number one, it's not really true. So we have the, the same old government policy as always, but the government now uses science as a cover. They dress up in scientific mm. clothing and mm. borrow science, science's legitimacy because the mm. political elite can't make principled arguments, they're distrusted, people are apathetic. Secondly, even if it was true, um, you know, that evidence-based government policy was, was coming in, it would still be problematic. I think the idea that the policy should be decided away from public engagement by scientific evidence and the people who interpret it is p very potentially undemocratic, something that, that we need to be very careful about. And also, I, th I think the question has to be raised, is science even the right tool to, to go about organising government policy? Thirdly, I think that evidence-based policy runs the risk of damaging both science itself, with, with the kind of examples that were given just a moment ago, and also the public's perception and attitudes towards science, because people aren't stupid. They'll know when science is being used as a tool to tell them what to do, and then, as as a consequence, will become more 
more suspicious towards science? I work in science policy, and there's two areas of science policies. There's science that should inform public policy, which we're talking about today, and then there's also policies for science and engineering. And so as a campaigning organization, we're obviously keen that evidence should inform science policy decisions. But also, we're keen that science should play its role in policy and political debates. And if s politicians do hide behind science, then they're obviously not, they're doing a disservice to the democratic process, but they're also doing a disservice to science. But the purpose of evidence-based policymaking is to make better informed decisions. And it's not to replace political or democratic life. It's, it's there to help make sure that those areas that are impossible to, to know without research and evidence that, that they, those areas are informed and developed with that evidence in, in hand. And so what, what do we want you know, out of science in these areas? It's a messy and complex process, but what you want to make sure that's happening is that the research and the evidence in these areas which, which need to be informing these policy decisions are out there, they're open, they're debated, and that they're um, available to politicians because if we don't make sure that science is engaged in these debates, then we're, un we're undermining one of the core um, reasons for investment in science and, and support for scientific advice and policy making. And so going forward, you know, and this debate is about politics and the election. A few things that we're really keen to see, when there is policy choices that need to be informed by research, that there is the ability for departments to commission that, to assess it, to analyze it. So that means having a scientific advisory system that is, um, and has its integrity intact, that has chief scientific advisors across the departments. And the area that we're really keen on is about um, the Treasury having a chief scientific advisor to inform science policy decisions in regard to funding. And finally, you know, it is politicians then that have to make these decisions and be accountable both for their decisions, but also how they treat scientific advice and advisors. Do you think that in certain instances, and particularly around climate change, uh, science has gone too far in trying to push uh, society and governments towards an outcome? The IPCC is um, an example of a scientific advisory process. And it's a remarkable one of trying to gather the evidence from around the world to inform, you know, in the end, political decisions. And the thing that, you know, needs to be done in those um, processes is that they're robust, that they're accountable, that when there is faults in them that they are corrected, because that is the part of the scientific process that is, needs to be maintained. But part of it is also what, um, how scientists can almost make sure that they're, that the evidence elucidates different policy choices and the probable consequences of different policy choices. And now that's part of what the IPCC was trying to do uh, about, you know, under different scenarios. And I think it's really important that how we design um, and see through that scientific assessment process is done in a way that maintains the integrity of scientific advice, whilst also is something that politicians and policymakers can use to make better informed choices. And I think there's a lot of discussion now about how the IPCC goes forward and deals with some of these issues that have been raised um, in the last assessment. So uh, I think one of the biggest problems with uh, evidence-based policy at the moment is that we don't have many people with any scientific background or training in Parliament. Um, and they don't really know what they're talking about. And when you add to that the fact that um, in this country, we don't have particularly good science education at a basic level. Um, I'm pretty sure that, that from, what, from what I've seen of what people are saying and from what um, policies seem to be, be coming out of um, Parliament, people don't really understand um, the scientific method when they're then trying to have to grapple with lots of different evidence saying lots of different things. They don't really understand uh, how, how these many different findings can, can uh, come about from different studies. They don't understand how to uh, merge them all together. And while scientific advisors, I think, are necessary, because you're never going to have uh, politicians be experts on everything, I think we've become over-reliant on them because our politicians know very little, on the whole, about how science works and how to interpret evidence. Um, and all they can do is cherry-pick, because they don't, they don't really realise that cherry-picking it doesn't really make any sense in the context of science. Um, I, I just think it's quite interesting that the pan are accepting that this evidence-based policy is science because it does seem to me that sometimes it is science and sometimes it's what I deem 
isn't science. So maybe an example I'd give. So, Evan, so for example, okay, if you, you know, come into government and you're deciding should we have energy, you know, so that's actually a whole load of decisions, which I think whether you go for nuclear energy would be not just a scientific one, but say you think, oh, yeah, we will build some nuclear energy plants, and I can see you're bringing in scientists to sort of say which is the best nuclear energy plant we're going to build in. But it seems to me a lot often the things that they say, this is scientific evidence, is things like, for example, the big agenda at the moment within earlier years or, or family policies, happiness and well-being and our, you know, our children well-being. So you have these sort of evidence, which is I've asked people whether they're happy and whether children are more happy yeah. in this scenario. And a whole raft of very interventionist policies are being made saying this is evidence. I mean, I think, Jeremy, your example of saying, oh, science shows short shop shock by... Uh, they sent some people into American prisons who haven't done... You, know, you just think you could deconstruct that and say how unscientific anything around that surrounding that study must be, I would say. But then, interesting, you're using that to say, oh, this shows science proves uh, that short shop, sh sh short shop shock doesn't work. I'd say it isn't science at all. Uh, I'd like to agree with the lady who just spoke, actually. I think um, far too little reflection is done on whether or not the scientific method really is as valid as people see it is. And I think politicians tend to hide behind science because the public don't understand it, are unable to completely unpick what happens. People think that peer review is a gold standard. And really, it just isn't. I mean, it's, it's a, an orthodoxy as much as anything. And I think these things are open to debate. The idea of science being self-correcting, it just doesn't happen that way. I mean, like as Thomas Kuhn, Kuhn showed, it works in, in terms of paradigm shifts rather than people discovering uh, a, a particular problem with a particular theory. I think things, things are much more fluid than that and, and, and people are afraid because they don't understand science to actually question what scientists say. But scientists are not you know, the arbiters of fundamental truths. Science is a model like anything and it, it, it's valid to question scientists. Uh, Peter Sammons, I just sort of pick up on that last point. I just wonder what the panel think about the, the distorting effect this uh, science-based uh, policy might actually have on science itself. I don't just mean in terms of NICE might changing its decision, but actually uh, one member of the panel actually said you know, robust, uh, making sure the systems of science are robust. And does that mean that politicians now expect actually to scientists to pr produce a robustness in, for instance, the peer review process, which, which really just isn't isn't there. So, so what effects does actually this, oh, this emphasis on science-based policy have on, on the scientific method itself? The presentation so far by the panel and most of the questions implicitly are discuss discussing natural science research. If we're looking at issues to do broadly with social problems, most of the research in this area is done by social scientists and depending on their particular discipline, where they're doing the research and so on, the outcomes are much more likely to have contradictions in them and that creates the temptation for politicians to cherry pick based on their own existing uh, prejudices which science they are going to um, put forward. Well the question about climate change, I mean Ali G I think put it very well when he said to uh, Buzz Lightyear as he put it, the astronaut, what do you say to those conspiracy theorists who say there is no moon? <laughs> which rather threw the, uh, the guy. And so, um, yes, there may have been some over-egging the pudding, but there is a pudding. Peer review isn't perfect, and I've been arguing that we need to look at the policy of peer review and see how it can be improved, but it's better than nothing at all, so much better than nothing at all, or what politicians do. And I always use this joke, you know, to this government, peer review is getting a couple of baronesses to cast their eye across a press release. But w when we're talking about what science, scientific advisory committees do, they don't say, here's a paper, which may or may not be perfect. They say, this is what the bulk of the evidence suggests. And they also put it in terms of how confident they are. And what we've also asked on the Select Committee, or what I've asked, is the government, when it says something is evidence-based, to say what the strength of the evidence, because it's not a binary thing, evidence-based, not evidence-based. It's the strength of the evidence, the degree of uncertainty. And that is almost, I would say it's more important than the principle of evidence-based. What's worse than anything, and I've said this and it's in our report, is non-evidence-based policy dressed up as evidence-based, given the veneer of scientific credibility, which not only, which is worse than, you know, just Chris Grayling on his own.
or, or, or Jackie Smith or Alan, any Home Secretary basically, on their own because it gives them a veneer that they don't deserve of credibility when those policies should stand on the basis of all the other issues I raised and, and you should never pollute the, the vocabulary of calling something scientifically based when it isn't and that's why we need to have extremely robust rules about the publication and the independence and the academic freedom around uh, scientific advisory committees and that's why the bullying and then the unfair sacking of David Nutt was so important I don't know, I, I want to come back on the point that Martha raised about how a lot of people in Parliament don't have a scientific background. I think that's quite an interesting question because it does chime in with the way people are thinking about politics nowadays. Previously, it didn't used to be a problem if people had, didn't have a scientific background. I, I would be surprised if Churchill or Attlee or anyone like that had a you know, PhD in neuroscience because it didn't matter. Politics was based on the people who actually had to live with the consequences of government policy in the real world. And it was argued for by people with an ideological and political justification for what they were doing. They didn't have to hide behind science. It would obviously be preferable if they were, but it's not the, the, the central crux of what's going on. I want to come back to the, the three things that Evan suggested should be determined by evidence-based policy, which are public health, the environment, and nuclear safety. I think even those areas are still kind of constructed by a social uh, set of presuppositions. You know, the idea that public health, the answer is often in the question that's asked about this in this kind of area. So there's a study comes out that says, oh, if we raise the price, minimum price for a unit of alcohol, we will reduce drunkenness and death or whatever. But the, the assumption is already made that drunkenness is a bad thing that the government should be clamping down on. The thing that's not being included in that uh, scientific analysis there is the idea of freedom, that people might want to be able to drink without restriction from the government. There's a political assumption that's already taken into account in so many of these areas. And then you can say, oh, this study says that this will do X and Y. But the presuppositions that are underlying that piece of research haven't been addressed. Science can be distorted by scientists becoming champions for a particular uh, area and I think it's a really, really difficult nut to crack because you find something out in a, in a scientific sense, uh, global warming is happening, how to build a nuclear bomb, Einstein was faced with that problem uh, after the bomb had been created. What do you do about it? Do you become a campaigner? Uh, and say all the science says this, therefore I'm going to get up there and I'm going to stand up and shout and scream about it. And the, the fear there is that science becomes just another self-serving pressure group. And I think that's really dangerous. But on the other hand, if scientists say, oh yeah, global warming's happening, we're not going to do anything about it, everybody ignores it. So, so, so there is always, and I think there always has been, this tightrope which you, you walk between science and politics. And I think global warming over the last really 10 years has shown that, that 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 boundary is becoming blurred. Basically on the one about scientists, engineers, mathematicians standing for parliament, there are a number of them and we have a blog called The Science Vote and some of those prospective candidates as well as standing and sitting MPs who are standing again um, have blogged for us about the importance of having scientists um, involved in public and political life and I think you know do look at your candidates, it's not just the ones that are have a science or engineering background, um, but also just ask them questions in the run-up to the election about questions in either national or constituency-based around on these issues. And about evidence-based policy making, I think the big thing there is about the research methodology, you know, and also the process by which the revolution that evidence-based medicine has gone through over the, you know, numerous years, other areas, especially like evidence-based conservation, where practitioners' assumptions are being challenged by, you know, rigorous systematic reviews of what is the evidence. And now I think those sorts of, you know, those, that, the, the methodologies around um, s synthesizing and assessing different and multiple sources of data and evidence is absolutely critical to finding finding out where, where does the evidence stand, what is their confidence in that research, where does more research need to be done so we have better informed um, practice but also better informed policy. Uh, um, <clears throat> Evan uh, mentioned the David Nuss affair and I thought it was an interesting case study um, because on, on the one hand I, ha I actually had a little bit of sympathy for Alan Johnson because David Nutt's comments did feel a little bit like the tail wagging the dog 
unfortunately, Johnson's policy was of tail-led wagging, um, and therefore, you know, he really was asking for it. Actually, I find it very difficult to believe the outcomes of any scientific advisory body at all now. Once you put so much faith or put so much emphasis on the scientific finding, then that's where the power lies, and people will start packing committees and so on to, uh, to, uh, to influence things. As a, as a non-natural science example, the UNICEF report from about two or three years ago, which basically said life for children in uh, Britain is going to, to hell in a handcart, and then you actually looked at the methodology involved in that with absolutely bizarre understanding of what people, you know, a child's welfare should be. So at, e even at the level of the kind of the, the, these kind of disinterested scientific bo um, advisory bodies, it, even that I think is very much corrupted by this uh, politicisation of science. I'd like to suggest that, in essence, science is just the most prominent victim of the way political institutions and policy-making institutions are unable to cope with inference, with uncertainty, and with the distinction between fact and value. I'd like to propose that what we need is to make sure that we discuss, interrogate values and desired outcomes when we're discussing policy, but not that we get rid of science and evidence. What we're missing here is a clear vision of the kind of world and the kind of country that we want to live in. Uh, and the real po problem with uh, science-based policy is not that science is being uh, dressed up or that um, it's wrong or it's right. Uh, science is that it's the only game uh, in, in the park at the moment. And I think that's it. We, we don't have that vision. And therefore, that's the real problem with science policy. It seems to me that what we have now is a rehabilitation of the idea of the divide between the educated elite and the uneduc uneducated mob, but now it's done through scientific terms. And we even today have the science communicators who look to me like the intermediaries between the educated elite and the uneducated mob, the kind of new priestly class. And um, I, it strikes me, it's, it's very interesting that science has become a new form of political elitism where scientists, for some reason, have more authority to pronounce on issues than ordinary members of the public. So whenever I say something about climate change, someone says, you can't say that, you don't understand the science. If I say I think we should liberalise all drugs, people say, oh, you obviously haven't read the science. So I would like to ask the panel why a scientist's view on an issue should count more for more than my libertarian views on an issue. Um, in terms of David Nutt, the big lesson there is about how ministers deal with scientific advice and advisors and how they make sure that they don't interfere with the integrity of scientific advice. And, and you know, that's the big thing we're looking for in terms of the election is having a strong ministerial code that has provisions to protect scientific advice and advisors from communicating and from engaging in these debates. In terms of values, you know, science doesn't take away values from public life and public discussions. You know, it, it's, it's there to in, help inform those public debates, but it's not there to replace it. These debates, I think, well, you know, what we want is, you know, scientists to go out there and, and debate these issues and with as a wider audience as possible, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There's an old anarchist slogan, which is uh, about elections. Whoever you vote for, the government always gets in. I think in this election, whoever you vote for, the scientists will get, get in. That's not a kind of conspiracy on the part of scientists. That's down to politicians, who, as, as Rob made an excellent point, is tail-led wagging. Politicians are no longer able to articulate competing views of how society ought to be, and are so having to outsource their authority onto scientists. You might paraphrase it as an attempt to replace right and left with right and wrong. So I think that what we have to do as, as the public is to come up with some new ideas and some new ways of doing politics and you know of, of course we'll be informed by scientific evidence in, in what we want to do with the, you know rebuilding the world in the way that we want to do it but what will ultimately be determining that is us and not some external authority of natural science. Most of the academic scientists I've met think that science should be used for the benefit of the most people. And I think that politicians are trying to play that game as well. At least I hope they are. There is a danger that science could be co-opted by people with a particular viewpoint, packing advisory panels and such things. That is a danger we have to be aware of. But in the end, science and politics, I think, are trying to get the same thing. Science is, should be, correct use of science should be the ally of libertarians because a libertarian position is don't ban things a uh, liberal position might be don't ban things unless you can show harm and obviously harm is often exaggerated by populism
uh, CRB checks and all that. And if you can get science, and if you can show that there's no good evidence of effectiveness, that the default is don't do it, don't ban things, then it is a weapon of liberals and libertarians, I would say. Mm -hmm.